Welcome to The War at Home, World War II Poster Propaganda, an online U.S. history tutorial for students in 11th grade. Let's start by reviewing some basics about World War II. This war pitted the Allies, which included the United States, Great Britain, and the Soviet Union, against the Axis powers, which included Nazi Germany, Imperial Japan, and Fascist Italy. Although its causes are many, the start of World War II is usually considered to be Germany's invasion of neighboring Poland in 1939, an event which caused Poland's allies, Britain and France, to declare war on Germany. World War II ended in 1945 when the remaining Axis powers, first Germany and then Japan, surrendered unconditionally to the Allies. The United States did not join the war at its beginning, even though it had friendships with Allied nations and was generally opposed to the Axis. Most Americans viewed the World War as the problem of other nations and wanted the U.S. to stay out. What changed? On December 7, 1941, hostilities between the U.S. and Japan led to the Japanese sneak attack on Pearl Harbor in Hawaii, an ambush that destroyed much of the Pacific Naval Fleet. Within days, America had declared war on Japan and the Axis. The poster you see here was one of the first works of wartime propaganda designed for the U.S. Office of War Information. It appeared in early 1942, when the December 7th attack on Pearl Harbor was very fresh in people's minds. The anger, fear, and frustration Americans felt then were as powerful as the emotions people experienced after the 9-11 attacks in the early 21st century. Look carefully at the image. It shows an American flag, with 48 stars for the 48 states at that time, tattered and ripped. The damaged flag flies at half-mast, America's symbolic response to a tragedy. The disaster at Pearl Harbor isn't shown explicitly. Instead, thick black smoke in the background evokes the attack. But the words below leave no mistake which event is being depicted. Remember December 7th. The text on top reads, We here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain. Do you recognize these famous words? They're from Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg Address, delivered close to a century earlier. Lincoln said these words to his nation during the Civil War, when hundreds of thousands of Americans had already sacrificed their lives, with no clear end in sight. In 1942, Americans had only begun to sacrifice for the war effort that would eventually defeat the Axis powers. What do you think Americans thought and felt when they saw this image in the raw weeks and months after Pearl Harbor? Probably a mix of emotions. People who saw the poster felt angry, especially at the Japanese. They wanted payback. Americans had wanted to avoid becoming part of a war, but now they were fully involved and would be expected to help the war effort in ways both large and small. By drawing on Lincoln's words, the poster connected the present conflict to another war in which Americans had been asked to sacrifice for a greater good, to save the Union and democracy. Those who saw the poster were likely filled with a determination that those who lost their lives at Pearl Harbor shall not have died in vain. Their sacrifice would be given meaning by the United States and its allies, who would fight to make the entire world safe for democracy. Probably more than a few young men volunteered for the armed forces after seeing this poster and absorbing its powerful message. We've used the term already, but now let's properly define propaganda. Here's a good definition. A form of communication aimed at influencing or altering the attitude of a population to get them to do something or believe something. Propaganda is sometimes called publicity or spin. It's often described with words like biased, misleading, or exaggerated, which should tell you that propaganda sometimes gets a bad reputation. This is probably because all propaganda is designed to manipulate its intended audience in some way. And propaganda, by its very nature, is one-sided. It doesn't allow for multiple points of view or for nuance. Some of the best examples of propaganda are the advertisements you see every day on TV, on the Internet, or in magazines. Each one tries to sell you something, whether it's dog food, an iPhone, or a new car. All ads are propaganda, and the best ones have a simple message that sells you the advertiser's point of view, making you feel like you want or even need to buy the product being sold. That's how ads get consumers to both believe something and to do something. During World War II, poster propaganda functioned as ads for the war effort. From 1942 to 1945, the United States Office of War Information, the OWI, was a government agency in charge of coordinating wartime propaganda both at home and abroad. The OWI produced radio shows, movies, and documentary films designed to shape the public's perception of the war. 
It also hired artists and graphic designers to create posters, including many of the ones you'll see in this tutorial. Poster art was one of the easiest and cheapest ways for the government to communicate its messages to the public. The posters were ubiquitous during the war years. People saw them displayed everywhere they went, at the bus stop, at the post office, in the grocery store. The best propaganda posters conveyed powerful messages simply with bold images, colors, and words. Each one sold the American people something that the government wanted them to think, do, or not do. Although the war took place overseas, defeating the Axis and helping the Allies became the number one domestic priority of the U.S. government. The military alone couldn't do the job. World War II was a total war, in which the efforts of civilians at home were almost as important as what soldiers accomplished on the front lines. This is where propaganda played a valuable role in coordinating the efforts and the mindset of the American people. World War II posters came in many different varieties, depending on what message the government wanted to send and who the target audience was. Let's start by looking at some posters intended to boost the morale of the general population. Morale is the positive feeling that someone can win or accomplish their goal. Soldiers in combat clearly needed their morale to remain high, but so did civilians at home. People living through World War II in real time didn't know when or how the war would end. All they knew was that they faced dangerous opponents and an uncertain outcome with the future of the world at stake. So it was important to make citizens feel like the war would be won and that it was going to have a positive outcome, even though no one really knew that at the time. This poster has a simple but effective message. Together we win. Notice how three different hands converge in the victory grip. The hand of Uncle Sam at top, the hand of a blue-collar factory worker on the left, wearing a welding glove, and the hand of a white-collar worker, maybe the factory's boss, on the right. In addition to its positive message, the poster encouraged people to get behind their labor management committee. These organizations helped workers, employers, and union representatives come together to solve problems. It was crucial to avoid labor strikes during wartime. This similar poster declares, United We Win, and it features two factory laborers working together. The poster is unusual for its time in that it features an African-American prominently. Most World War II posters didn't. Black workers did find improved opportunities for well-paying factory jobs during the war, so this poster may have been designed to appeal to African-Americans specifically. This poster features the same morale-boosting slogan, but it's quite different in its focus. Here, the United Nations of the Allied Powers take the shape of cannon barrels, all blasting as one at the same target. The big three allies, the U.S., Great Britain, and the Soviet Union, are in front, but notice that many other allies, China, Mexico, Australia, Norway, Brazil, are visible just underneath. Images like these not only told Americans they would win, but reminded them that they weren't in the fight alone. Other posters targeted the men and women who worked in America's factories and assembly lines, producing materials and weapons for the war. The U.S. had to mobilize its domestic economy for mass production in the same way that the armed services had to mobilize troops for combat. In the early 1940s, the nation was just emerging from the Great Depression. Jobs had been scarce, and factories had produced below their capacity. All that changed during World War II. The American economy exploded, becoming what many called the arsenal of democracy for the Allies and the world. The nation's largest and most capable manufacturers, the Detroit automakers Ford and General Motors, switched almost entirely to wartime production. Two months after Pearl Harbor, the last new civilian cars rolled off the assembly lines, and for the next several years, it was almost impossible to buy a brand new car in the United States. Instead, automakers produced not only cars, trucks, and parts for the military, but tanks, planes, and munitions. American production was one of the true miracles of World War II and was one of the biggest factors in the Allied victory. U.S. workers produced approximately 7,000 ships, 88,000 tanks, 300,000 planes, 3 million vehicles, and literally billions of bullets and bombs. American production alone more than doubled the total wartime production of Germany, Japan, and Italy combined. The government motivated production with the kind of posters you see here, which might have been seen in factories. This striking image shows the bomb of more production being dropped on an image that combines the symbols of both Germany and Japan. And this humorous poster depicts production as an eight ball about to knock the Axis leaders in every direction. From left to right, the three pool balls represent Benito Mussolini, Italy's fascist leader, Prime Minister Tojo of Japan, and Adolf Hitler. Naturally, some posters served as recruitment tools for the U.S. armed forces. 
More than 16 million Americans served in uniform during the World War II years. Some soldiers and sailors were drafted, ordered to report for duty, but most volunteered for service. Young men volunteered for a variety of reasons. Most believed that World War II was truly a good war that needed to be fought and won for freedom and democracy. Some fought for revenge to defeat the Japanese and the Nazis. Others viewed the war as the great adventure of their lives. They wouldn't have missed it for the world. And still others joined up out of peer pressure, fearing that they would be remembered as cowards if they didn't fight. For the millions of potential soldiers who were on the fence or who didn't volunteer in the first wave of recruitment after Pearl Harbor, posters like these used a variety of tactics to encourage enlistment. This poster for the Army specifically targeted 18- and 19-year-olds right out of high school. It showed in detail the different ranks they could attain and the salary for each, $50 a month for a private. These posters for the Navy and Coast Guard reminded young Americans that your country and your liberty are in grave danger and urged them to remember Pearl Harbor. And let's not forget Uncle Sam himself. He wants you to sign up for the Army in one of the most iconic images in all of American history. Although this poster was actually designed to recruit soldiers for the First World War a generation earlier, it was still widely in use during World War II. Many posters encouraged people to buy war bonds. Fighting and winning World War II was a colossally expensive undertaking. It's estimated that the war cost the United States almost $300 billion in 1940s dollars. Adjusted for inflation, the cost in today's dollars would reach well into the trillions. How did America afford it? The government did raise taxes and cut other expenses, but additional sources of revenue were needed. Starting in 1941, Series E bonds were sold directly to the American people, giving them the chance to invest in the war effort. Here's how it worked. Bonds could be purchased for $18.75. The government then used that money to buy ships, tanks, planes, bombs, uniforms, food, medicine, everything needed to defeat the Axis. The owner of the bond received a piece of paper, essentially a stock certificate. The government guaranteed that in 10 years, each bond could be redeemed for $25, a nice return on the original investment. In this way, buying war bonds was an investment in your country, but also an investment in your own family's future. The plan worked. Over the course of the war, 85 million Americans bought more than $180 billion worth of bonds. Even children were encouraged to buy bonds. Because they couldn't afford the full cost, kids purchased stamps for 25 cents and saved them in booklets until they had enough. Americans were even encouraged to give war bonds as Christmas presents. In addition to propaganda posters, some of America's most famous actors, singers, and celebrities toured the country to sell war bonds to the public. And characters like Bugs Bunny, Donald Duck, Batman, and Superman sold bonds in cartoons and comic books. The war years placed unusual demands on Americans at home and required many sacrifices. Rationing became a part of daily life. Rationing meant that during the war, people couldn't just walk into a store and buy as much as they wanted of whatever they wanted. They also couldn't fill up their cars with gas whenever they liked. Rationing placed limits on people's purchases so that there would be enough of everything to go around. The millions of Americans serving overseas also needed meat, coffee, sugar, gasoline, rubber, and oil, which meant that those goods were sometimes scarce on the home front. Households received ration books, coupons, and tokens dictating what they could buy, how much, and when. No one liked rationing, which was widely unpopular. To keep people's spirits up, posters like this tried to put a positive spin on things. On top, without rationing. The lady on the left is walking off with her arms full and a smug look on her face, leaving little for the lady on the right to purchase. With rationing, both ladies with their ration books in hand have the same amount and smiles on their faces. To make up for the inconvenience of rationing, Americans were encouraged to be self-sufficient by planting victory gardens in their own backyards. Growing your own food helped take the pressure off the public food supply. Other posters encouraged the canning of homegrown fruits and vegetables so people would have more to eat during the lean times and would be less annoyed by rationing. This poster even has a catchy slogan, I'm as patriotic as can be, and ration points won't worry me. Along the same lines, some propaganda posters were designed to discourage waste, like this one warning Americans to save rubber by checking the air pressure on their tires. This creative poster warns people that waste helps the enemy by using bits and pieces of everyday items like paper clips and rubber bands to form the face of Hitler. Americans were even ordered to clean their plates and not to prepare more food than they could eat. Food is a weapon. 
and recycling was now encouraged in an era when people were used to simply throwing everything away. The government asked people to donate paper, scrap metal, and even waste fats left over from their cooking. It could be used to make gunpowder. World War II propaganda posters didn't shy away from using guilt to drive home their points. Some posters were designed to make people feel insecure and ashamed that they weren't doing enough to help the war at home. Maybe if enough posters reminded them, they'd change their behavior. You talk of sacrifice, says this dramatic poster, but this fallen soldier knew the meaning of sacrifice. When Americans on the home front felt like complaining about rationing or recycling, propaganda like this was designed to put things in perspective. People were encouraged to form car-sharing clubs to carpool to work each day, which helped conserve gasoline. For the many people who ignored this request, a poster like this was designed to make them feel guilty and change their behavior. Have you really tried to save gas? asks the soldier. From the look on his face, it seems like he knows you haven't. And this famous poster told Americans that, when you ride alone, you ride with Hitler. World War II posters, as you've seen, used many different techniques to influence people's behavior. But guilt and shame actually proved to be some of the most powerful weapons in fighting the war at home. World War II posters also didn't hesitate to scare people to make their point. By threatening Americans with what might happen if the Allies lost the war, these posters provided a different kind of motivation not to lose it. These two posters convey the exact same message. In one, the threat is Germany, and in the other, it's Japan. Both images depict the enemy as if he's on the verge of coming out of the poster, attacking the viewer. And these two striking images show American children threatened by the Axis. In one, claw-like hands representing Germany and Japan reach out for a young mother and her baby. And in the other, three little children playing in their yard fall under the shadow of a Nazi swastika. Both posters use fear to motivate people's behavior. In this case, the buying of war bonds. A common theme of many posters was avoiding loose talk or loose lips. During the war years, millions of Americans were employed in the military or in government positions directly connected to the war, and millions of others were employed in industries that helped the war effort. These Americans loaded the ships, built the bombs, and packed the supplies that were headed overseas. They couldn't help but know sensitive information about the war, where a shipment of weapons was being sent, for example, or where a battleship full of sailors was headed. People naturally like to talk, especially when they think they know a secret. But during World War II, there was the very real danger that Axis spies or sympathizers in the United States might overhear valuable information and convey it to their allies, leading to American deaths. This led to one of the most famous of all wartime slogans, Loose lips might sink ships. There were spies helping the Axis, just like the Allies had spies in Germany and other enemy nations. Still, most weren't as obvious as this giant-eared Hitler, seen here eavesdropping on a soldier and his girlfriend as he carelessly spills wartime secrets. As with other propaganda posters you've seen, the government had no problem using guilt to make its point. If you talk too much, says this example, this man may die. By depicting the sailor very realistically, unlike some of the more cartoony images you've seen, the poster personalized the message and probably reminded its audience of somebody they knew. And this poster uses a sad puppy to make its point. The service flag in the background was a familiar sight in American homes during World War II. Households with a son or family member in uniform were given a flag with a blue star to display proudly. But a gold star flag meant that a family member, probably this dog's master, had died in service because somebody talked. World War II offered more opportunities for women to be involved than any previous war. Women could not fight in combat in the 1940s, but they could serve in the armed forces and perform a variety of other essential roles. In 1942, the Women's Army Corps, or WAC, was established as an auxiliary unit of the U.S. Army. For the first time, women could enlist in uniform in non-combat positions and could even serve as officers. They would be the first women other than nurses to serve in the Army. The U.S. Navy had a very similar branch called WAVES, Women Accepted to Volunteer Emergency Service. Note the two blue stars on the flag behind this young recruit's mother. One is for the he, referred to in the poster, probably a father or brother. But the other star represents this young lady, also serving her country in the Navy. The change became permanent. After the war, in 1948, the Women's Armed Services Integration Act enabled women to serve as regular members of the Army, Navy, Marines, and Coast Guard. Since relatively few women wound up joining the Army or Navy, other posters encouraged different kinds of service. 
the U.S. needed nurses in great numbers, so a new program, the United States Cadet Nurse Corps, aggressively recruited young women aged 17 to 35 with a high school education. Hoster stressed the educational value of the experience because participants would emerge as fully accredited nurses. They would receive a free lifetime education that could easily lead to a long-term career. Other posters recruited women to be women's ordinance workers, or WOWs, like Rosie the Riveter. While they weren't members of an official organization, WOWs played crucial roles in filling needed factory jobs with so many men in service overseas. They performed all the same tasks that their male co-workers did. Women were also recruited for government positions of all kinds. Often nicknamed the government girls during the war, women worked as many as one-third of civil service jobs in Washington, D.C. by 1944. Some served as typists and secretaries, but others were involved in intelligence work as employees of agencies like the FBI. This last poster shows yet another way that women could support the war effort. If they couldn't enlist or work in a wartime career, the poster suggests, women could support their loved ones in uniform by writing them V-mail in order to keep their morale high. Be with him at every mail call. Only a small number of wartime posters featured or were designed specifically to appeal to African Americans. Black soldiers could and did serve in the U.S. military. However, like much of the United States at the time, the armed forces were still highly segregated during World War II. Black and white soldiers served in different units and lived and ate in separate facilities. Early in the war, African Americans in uniform were disproportionately assigned to non-combat service positions. But as the war went on, they were far more likely to see combat, where most served with distinction. These two posters feature African-American subjects, and as such, they were probably designed to be displayed in black neighborhoods and to target relatively narrow audiences. This pilot represents one of the Tuskegee Airmen, a famous group of African-American fighter and bomber pilots. They were the first black aviators to serve in the U.S. military. All the airmen trained at the same airfield near Tuskegee, Alabama, and were educated at Tuskegee University. 992 pilots were trained during the war years and 84 lost their lives in combat or in accidents. The Tuskegee Airmen were subject to racist predictions that they would be inferior to white aviators, but by almost every measure, they distinguished themselves as one of the most accomplished groups of pilots in the entire war. Doris Dory Miller, the subject of this poster, was a real person and a true hero. Miller joined the Navy in 1939 as a cook, one of the few positions opened to black Americans at that time. In December 1941, he was serving on the battleship USS West Virginia when the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor. In addition to helping save the lives of many injured sailors, he manned a machine gun, a weapon he hadn't been trained on, to fight back against the enemy. Miller received national recognition for his bravery and was awarded the Navy Cross, which he wears proudly in this poster. He served in the Navy until his death in 1943, when his ship was torpedoed and sunk by a Japanese submarine.